because when I'm making my RISC-V processor that has 32 registers and they're all gonna be lined up on a bus, well, it's gonna be probably something like this long. But the point is that at least now I know how to properly terminate that bus. He did not know how to properly terminate that bus. It's chip tips, chip tips. I have no music and I can't sing. Let's review what we know so far. So we have a transmission line. This is a printed circuit board. We know that the characteristic impedance is something like 100 ohms. So we have a driver on one end and we have a 100 ohm source termination. And then we've got our 100 ohm characteristic impedance transmission line. And on the other end is basically an open circuit. And we know that this nicely terminates the signal. So we get a nice clean signal. It bounces off the end of the transmission line. It comes back and it gets absorbed, done. Now, the thing is that I want to use this in a bus. So we have a long bus with lots of tracks going all the way across and we have cards that sit on the bus. Some of the cards are at the end, some of the cards are in the middle, and some of the cards are somewhere in between. So, if this is the driver for one of the cards, then this is not an accurate portrayal of what's going on on the bus, with the exception for the cards on the very end. So, first of all, let's suppose that we had another driver that does exactly the same thing and it's also terminated. It feeds another transmission line. It's also 100 ohms. And they're both doing exactly the same thing. They, they are both source terminated with 100 ohms. So basically, I'm taking one of these and I'm taking, you know, like another one of these and I'm putting them together. So the driver is basically sitting right in the middle of the bus and the ends are open circuit. Well, if these drivers are doing exactly the same thing and these transmission lines are doing exactly the same thing, then at any time, the voltage at this point is identical to the voltage at this point. And if we have two nodes with identical voltages, you can simply connect them because, well, there would be no current flowing because there's no voltage difference. And since this is basically doing exactly the same thing, we can also coalesce those drivers. And so these two nodes are connected. And finally, because we've got these two resistors now in parallel, we can simply make this as the equivalent resistor. And there is the equivalent driver. So this is the driver sitting in the middle of the bus. This is our source termination. And basically we have one side of the bus going off in that direction and the other side of the bus going off in the other direction. So we can see that to terminate a card on the end of the bus properly, we would need a 100 ohm source termination. But to terminate a driver that's sitting smack in the middle of the bus, we would need a 50 ohm source termination resistor, not a 100 ohms. So then the question is, well, what happens if we have a driver somewhere in between? So if this is our bus, and we know that at the ends, we have to use 100 ohms, and in the middle, we know that we have to use 50 ohms, then as we vary the position smoothly between the midpoint and the end point, that resistance also has to change smoothly from 50 ohms to 100 ohms. Now, we don't exactly know how that resistance is going to change. Does it go smoothly and monotonically from 50 to 100? Does it go up and then down? Does it go down and then up? We don't know. And that's why I have another test board. So with this test board, I have this chip. It's physically in the middle of this board, however, I have 60 centimeters equivalent over here because of these um, zigzaggy traces, and I have 90 centimeters over here. So basically this is not sitting in the middle, it's sitting closer basically to this end. So 
let's see what happens when I use just the plain old 100 ohm resistor. Okay, so the setup is the same as before. I have a buffer over here, and I have my square wave generator feeding the input to this buffer, and the output of the buffer goes to a 100 ohm source termination resistor, and we've got 60 centimeters on one side and 90 centimeters on another side. So uh, first what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at what's going on on the 60 centimeter side. Okay. So here's what's happening on the 60 centimeter side. So remember that uh, at the time that we detect the uh, waveform, the waveform has already hit the end. So if I pull up my cursors and move one of them to approximately where the waveform starts, and we can see that we hit the end up here, oops, go away, go away. So we hit the end over here, here, let me get a pointer. And immediately the waveform rises up to, it looks like around two volts. And then it sort of eh, slowly goes up, it goes down a little bit, and then it goes back up to, well, it looks like about 3.3 mm, volts. It, you know, jiggles around a little bit, but in any case, um, if we take a look at maybe, I don't know, when that voltage starts to dip, maybe, um, we get a difference of 7.6 nanoseconds. Now, we've already determined that the wave on this printed circuit board goes something like um, 18 centimeters per nanosecond. Um, it's a little faster than half light speed. So if we see how long 18 centimeters is over 7.6 nanoseconds, that's um, 136, well, let's call it 140 or so centimeters. So clearly something happens 140, uh, 140 centimeters later. So here's maybe what I think is going on. So by the time the wave hits 60 centimeters over here, the wave has also hit 60 centimeters on the other side. So that's our starting point. Now, this wave goes 30 centimeters, and then it comes back to here 120 centimeters. And then, you know, if it goes past this resistor, then it would have to go an additional 60 centimeters to 180 centimeters. So that's clearly not what's going on. So maybe what is going on is the wave over here goes 60 centimeters over to the termination resistor and then bounces off of it for whatever reason and comes back. That's about 120 centimeters. So that's a little closer. So maybe that's what's going on over here. What is clearly not happening is that the bounce is not getting fully absorbed by that 100 ohm termination resistor, which we expected because of our intuitive exploration of what happens with a driver in the middle of a termination line. Nevertheless, this is a reasonable wave. Now let's take a look at what happens on the other end. This is the 90 centimeter end. Okay, so that's what's happening at the 90 centimeter end. Now again, we've got one cursor, um, Right at the very beginning of the wave, we can see that it goes up to about two volts, which again would be expected. Um, actually, what that means is that we've probably got a one volt wave floating this way, and then when it bounces off, it doubles, so that means that we get two volts over here. And then it seems to slowly creep up, and then it starts bouncing around like crazy. Uh, let's take a look at where that peak is. So that peak is 3.7 volts. That's not great. And then it bounces down to something like uh, 2.75 volts, uh, which is okay. It, it is still above the threshold. Um, it's just that this bouncing around is a little uh, disconcerting. And I also don't like the fact that the wave actually goes above our supply voltage of 3.3 volts. So again, clearly, you know, not the best termination.
Uh, and just for completeness, let's see what happens right at the source. So here, maybe it's a little clearer what's going on. So we start from zero and we bounce up to a little bit over one volt, which makes sense. We already know that uh, one volt must be traveling down the line because it got doubled to about two volts. And in fact, that's probably what this little um, plateau right in the middle is all about. So let's take the second cursor and move it to just about where the waveform starts to rise again. So it's showing uh, 6.67 nanoseconds. Okay, so that's 6.67 centimeters. So, uh, sorry, 6.67 nanoseconds. So let's take 6.67 and multiply that by our 18 centimeters per nanosecond. And we get, wow, just about 120 centimeters. Well, that's not a coincidence because that is exactly the distance between the source, the end, back to the source again. So obviously that's what this wave is. This is the wave coming back over here. Now, this next plateau, um, if we move our cursor to the very beginning of where it starts to rise, it looks like something like 2.7 nanoseconds. Now, what I think is going on here is we've got 120 centimeters of time over here. Now, during that 120 centimeters, this wave on the other end has traveled 90 centimeters and 120 centimeters. So it's got basically 60 centimeters to go. So what's 2.7 or so? 2.7 times 18 is 48, well, okay, it's 50. It's not exactly 60. Um, maybe this isn't exactly 90, I don't know. Uh, but in any case, that's probably the wave that's coming back from here. So it looks like that jumped up by an additional volt. So now uh, the next thing that happens is we get another rise. So if we go, let's see, to something like that. That's 6.27 nanoseconds, which we know is approximately 120, uh, is 120 centimeters. So that's probably this wave that came from here and maybe it's bouncing back over here. So the thing that I want to really point out and the takeaway from this is that, again, without a proper source termination, you're gonna get waves sloshing back and forth between the ends of the transmission lines. Now, this isn't bad. It doesn't go up and then all the way down and then all the way up again. And once it does hit 3.3 volts, it stays there very nicely. So that's in the middle. Again, on the ends, uh, this end was pretty good. This end had some bouncing around. So this was with 100 ohms. Now, let's go and take something closer to 50 ohms and see what happens. So I have another stick over here. This one is terminated with a 51 ohm resistor. I don't have any 50 ohm resistors. So I'm simply going to transfer power and signal over to the new stick. And now that's connected up. And now we're going to look at, well, how about the 60 centimeter end again? Okay. So we would expect that the wave, as it hits the end of the transmission line and it doubles, we would expect that to be higher simply because we have a lower source resistance. So, you know, with that voltage divider, we're feeding more, uh, more of a voltage kick over to the transmission line. So it looks like it rises up to, wow, something like uh, two point, well, what is it? Uh, 2.7 volts. So we know that the initial wave being launched was about half that or 1.35 volts. So it goes up and then it sort of creeps up and then it bounces down a little bit. Um, and the point at which it bounces down looks to be, again, something like 2.7 volts. And then it goes up to about 3.3 volts and then it starts, you know, sort of ringing around that. Again, 
This isn't that bad. Now let's take a look at the 90 centimeter end. Uh, that's even worse. So again, we have what we expected, which is um, something like 2.7 volts when we get the voltage doubling at the end of the transmission line. Then it slowly starts to creep up, but then it really jumps up. So clearly something's going on where we double the voltage, it comes back, and then something else comes back and really adds the heck out of the voltage. Um, in fact, it goes all the way up to 4.7 volts or so. That's very high. Um, that's like 1.3 volts above our supply voltage. And what's worse is that the bouncing is also worse. If we look at this uh, bounce down, it's, well, that's not too bad. It's 2.7 volts. So again, it's above the logic threshold. Uh, but nevertheless, this peak is kind of worrisome, um, and it does seem to take uh, a while to sort of calm down. Now let's take it, a look at the wave right in the middle. And, you know, again, we could probably explain this where we get uh, the initial voltage rise. Um, it sort of shoots up and then it settles down to something like what we expected. Um, and then it sort of stays there until the wave from the short end comes back and then it rises and then we get another rise and then we get, you know, a little bit of bouncing, but you know, it, it doesn't look too bad. So with 51 ohms of termination, we know that we've sort of got a bad um, result at the long end of the termination line. So if going down to 50 ohms wasn't correct, in fact, it made it worse. What happens if we go above the original 100 ohms? So what I have here is another stick that I've prepared. And if I measure, it's 200 ohms. So I've got a 200 ohm resistor over here. So again, let's take a look at the wave and see what we get. So why don't we go right to the um, worst point, which is the long end. So this is interesting. Um, it's certainly not going above the supply voltage, which certainly is a good thing. So when we start, we see an immediate rise to, uh, it looks like about one point two volts or so. Uh, so we know that uh, the wave being launched was about half that, which is something like 0.6 or 0.7 volts, which again makes sense because our uh, source termination is a lot higher. Then it kind of creeps up and then it jumps up again, um, just about by the same amount. Uh, now we're at something like uh, 2.4 volts or 2.5 volts, then it droops down to 2.2 volts or so, uh, and then it goes up to something like 3.1 volts, and then it sort of bounces around a little bit. Um, in fact, it doesn't seem to rise uh, to 3.3 volts, but that's okay, at least it's above the logic threshold. So that's not very good either, but at least we've solved one problem, which is we don't get that huge rise above the supply, which is certainly a problem because we don't wanna fry our inputs. Now, granted, the inputs of most logic chips are protected by diodes, but you don't really wanna rely on that protection. That's, that's not for um, extended use. Let's take a look at the short end. And here's what we see on the short end. Again, we see the usual doubling rise. It stays there for a little while, rises again, stays there for a little while, rises again, and it you know, slowly makes its way up to three volts or 3.3 volts. So again, this is an okay termination. It's not really ideal. And what it seems to be doing is stretching out the wave. So it's actually taking longer for us to get to its final state. So what do we do? Well, we know that 
50 ohms is too low, 200 ohms is clearly too high, we know that for a driver that is not in the middle, but probably somewhere over here maybe, we want something between 100 ohms and, 100, and 200 ohms, so let's just call it 150 ohms. So if we were to graph the resistor that we would want, at the end, at the very end, we would want 100 ohms. At this end, we would want 50 ohms, so that's here. And then somewhere maybe over here, we would want, say, 150 ohms. So that would be like this. So it looks like we're getting a curve maybe like this, and then it would probably do this. Unfortunately, we do not want to use a different resistor for every single card along the bus. First of all, uh, I'm going to have 32 cards. So, um, so first of all, there is no middle card, right? We would have two cards next to each other. Um, so we would have 16 on one side, 16 on the other side. So we would basically have 16 different values of resistor. Now, the second thing is that that means that every card could fit in only one of two slots or two of the 32 slots. And you would have to get that right, otherwise you wouldn't have a correct termination. So one possibility is to simply choose a middle value. Now, what would that middle value be? Well, is it 100 ohms? Well, it could be. Uh, that would certainly work for the end. Um, it didn't seem to work that well for this end, but if we were to look at the data sheet, we see that we have some limiting values over here. So the input voltage can go between negative 0.5 and plus 6.5. Now, does that mean that with a 3.3 volt supply, we can go up to 6.5 volts? I don't think so. Um, here are the recommendation, recommended operating conditions. So here's the supply voltage, could go up to 3.6 volts. And the input voltage, the maximum is 5.5 volts. So in fact, you know, maybe going above the supply voltage a little bit is actually okay. So we may be able to get away with a 100 ohm resistor. Now, just for fun, what I've done is I've taken the 100 ohm uh, termination, which is what I guess we've settled on to use, and I'm putting in a 20 megahertz uh, square wave signal into it, and let's see what it looks like on the long end. And that's what we're getting on the long end. So even 100 ohm uh, source termination is just not very good. Uh, if we take a look at where this peak occurs, um, it occurs around uh, 0.8 volts or so. And if we look at where this trough occurs, um, it's about 2.6 volts. But again, the wave is just not very clean. And let's take a look at the short end. That's really a crazy wave. Um, we can see that uh, during the transition, it doesn't even go down all the way to zero. Eventually it does, but it does actually pop back up to 1.5 volts, which is unfortunately above uh, the logic threshold for zero, which is around 0.8. Um, it does go below that eventually. Uh, in going up, there's this other little trough over here which goes down to 2.85, um, no, 1.93, which is unfortunately below the high threshold of two volts. So this is just not very good. It's, it's just not working. So what I've done is I've tried the other technique, which is end termination. So what I've done here is I've put a 100 ohm resistor to ground on one end, and also another 100 ohm resistor to ground on the other end. And the reason that you have to terminate both sides, of course, is that this is 100 ohms and this is 100 ohms. 
so you have to terminate both ends. Now, let's go ahead and see what the signal looks like at the end. Now that's a pretty clean signal. Uh, the low voltage is just about zero volts. Um, it does dip slightly below. It only goes to minus 0.2 volts, which is just fine. That's well within tolerance. And the high voltage goes only to about 2.5 volts. And the reason for that, of course, is that clamp uh, current that we saw of 50 milliamps. Nevertheless, 2.5 volts is still above the logic threshold. Um, and if we take a look at this uh, little peak up there, it looks like that goes up to 2.8, so that's okay. Let's take a look at the short end now. And again, we've got a pretty clean waveform, relatively speaking. Um, again, the low, again, the low level is just about zero volts, and it does dip below that to about 0.35 volts, again, well within spec. And for the high voltage, um, we end up at, again, around 2.5 volts. So everything seems to be going pretty well. The only problem with this is that, um, is that now we've got an output that is uh, required during the high periods to put out 50 milliamps. And during the low periods, it doesn't put out anything. And if we were to have all eight bits high, well, you know, that would be 400 milliamps, which apparently exceeds the total uh, capacity specified for this chip, which is 100 milliamps. So that's great. Um, the termination works perfectly, but unfortunately it exceeds the specs of the chip. Now, you could also use what's called a Thevenin termination, where, where you have one resistor going to ground and another resistor going to plus. And what you do to determine the effective resistance is you simply put them in parallel. So if we were to have 200 ohms and 200 ohms, that would be a 100 ohm termination. And we can do the same thing on the other side, 200 ohms and 200 ohms. But for any given DC level, all the chip is going to see is a 200 ohm resistor to the opposite voltage rail. So 200 in parallel with 200 would be 100. So basically we've halved our current requirement. Unfortunately, again, since uh, we're only allowed to go up to 100 milliamps of supply current, we'd still need 200 milliamps. So this is just no good for that. Uh, I suppose I could only use maybe half the chip, but that would be a real waste considering that I need 32 bits. And if each of these chips is four bits, then I would need eight of these chips. So that's no good. What else can we do? Well, another thought that I had is to uh, take this and remove the source termination, replace it with a zero ohm resistor, and then try the diode termination. Well, why not? I mean, I've got nothing to lose at this point. So let's try that. Okay, so what I've done here is I have soldered in uh, two diodes one going to ground, one going to uh, the power supply, uh, reverse biased, of course. And I've also put in the uh, power decoupling capacitor right over there. I've also done the same thing on the other side. I've used uh, BAT54s, B-A-T-5-4s. Uh, these are SOT23 packages. Um, there are various BAT54 packages. There's like, you know, A and C and S, and they all have different diode configurations. This is the kind with a single diode in it um, for, uh, for a uh, termination with one diode going to one place and one got diode going to the other place. Uh, you can use a single package, but basically this is all I had. So anyway, I've also replaced uh, the source termination resistor with a zero ohm resistor. So now we've got our 20 megahertz signal and let's see what the long end looks like. Okay, so that's, um, that's quite an interesting waveform. Uh, unfortunately, it seems to go up to four volts. 
and it goes down to 0.6 volts on the bottom. So remember that I said that you have to use a fast diode. Well, the, uh, this is a Schottky diode, and the forward voltage on this diode is supposed to be 0.2. Of course, it takes some time to respond, so it allows the signal to go down to minus 0.6 before it actually starts to uh, clamp that uh, voltage. And the same thing at the top, because our power supply is 3.3 volts, it would take a 3.5 volt signal to uh, forward bias the diode, but unfortunately, uh, the signal goes up to about uh, 4 volts or so. Yeah, it looks like 4 volts. So this is not a great termination. Let's take a look at the other side. Yeah, and that's got some bouncing in it. So that's not great either. Uh, we've got a trough of minus 0.8 volts or minus 0.86 volts and the high up here again is uh, 4 volts or so. Nevertheless it is a better signal than the uh, than the 100 ohm source terminated signal. So what I wonder is what happens if I put a source resistor over here uh, along with the diodes. I don't really know what's going to happen, um, but let's find out. So just for fun, I've put in a 62 ohm resistor because uh, that was the one that uh, was immediately at hand. So let's take a look at the long end. Well, again, that's um, not great. Uh, the waveform is not very uh, straight. Um, and it does sort of bounce a little bit. And if we look at the short end, the short end is uh, a little better. Um, it doesn't go all the way down to zero. Uh, it does bounce up to 0.7, which is below the threshold. And it does eventually go up to uh, 3.1 volts. So that's actually not so bad. Um, it, it, seems to do the job. Uh, let's go back to the uh, long end. And in terms of the long end, yeah, again, it's, it's not really very straight, um, but at least it does go below the threshold. Um, and it only goes down to 0.25 volts, which is not that bad. Uh, it does go up to three volts fairly cleanly. Uh, this bottom voltage is 2.6 volts, which is above the threshold. So this actually isn't that bad. So it's weird, but apparently some combination between a series resistor um, and a diode clamp at the end seems to work okay. Uh, let me just lower the frequency on this just a bit. to see what um, the long-term waveform looks like to make sure that there isn't any craziness. Okay, so this is at the long end. Um, we can see that it goes pretty much all the way up to uh, 3.7 volts and down to 2.7 volts, and then it just sort of rings around there. So that's okay, and let's look at the negative slope. And that too is not that bad. Uh, it does go from 3.3 all the way down to about 0.5 or so. Um, and then it climbs up to about 0.7. That is below the logic threshold for zero. Let's take a look at the short end. And again, that really isn't that bad. And if we look at the negative slope, and again, that really isn't too bad. Um, we have 
the maximum rise of that bounce is 0.7, which again is below the logic threshold. So, so this isn't that bad. It seems to work. This is a one megahertz signal. Um, so you can see that, you know, there is ringing, but even with a 20 megahertz signal, it worked okay. So this is probably what I'm going to end up using. Again, the problem is, what is the value of that series termination resistor? Well, um, that's a really good question. I should probably go back to my uh, stick where I have the driver on the end um, and then put a 50 or 62 ohm resistor over there and see what it looks like. Uh, or what I could simply do is cut this trace right over here. I may as well uh, save myself all that desoldering. Let's see what happens. So I went ahead and uh, cut the trace right over there. So uh, let's take a look at the only end that now exists, which is the long end. So uh, it looks pretty much uh, the same. Uh, it drops down and it rings a little bit. Let's take a look at the positive slope. And that's actually quite nice. It, it just goes up and it, uh, it doesn't even ring, which is uh, actually quite surprising, uh, quite pleasing, in fact. Um, and it goes up to 3.8 volts, which is within spec. So I think we're going to call this uh, the solution that I'm going to use. So a combination of a series termination of 62 ohms, because that's what I had, and I'm going to just go with it, um, and uh, output uh, these termination uh, clamp uh, and these termination diodes on the end. So that is what I'm going to design in. And the nice thing about this is that it doesn't actually use up any current uh, while the output is going to be stable at, you know, 3.3 volts or uh, zero volts or whatever, because these diodes are not going to conduct when the signal is between, uh, say, negative 0.2 and 3.5 volts. So that looks like it's going to be the solution. Excellent. All right. Well, now I have to go back and design my cards uh, to include this series termination uh, resistor on every output. I need to include buffers on every output as well. And then when I design the backplane, I'm going to need to be sure to use termination diodes on both ends. So I think the next video is probably going to show the RISC-V register designed with the buffers and the series termination. And we'll see how that works. So until next time, see ya. It's chip tips, chip tips, chip tips. I have no music and I can't sing.